laughter, one of the most familiar yet least understood of the body's responses. <laughs> Scientific examination reveals it to be a mystery, its role in human behavior unknown. Recent evidence indicates that laughter may be linked somehow to our mysterious ability to heal ourselves. Is laughter capable of keeping us well? What occurs when a person laughs is a sudden mental explosion. <laughs> I'd like to give you Bill Allen's baseball scoop. Scoop! I would rather have a comedian with me when I'm feeling badly than a doctor. What is the importance of laughter? Could it be linked to survival itself? Come with us now as we go in search of <laughs> laugh therapy. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. In India, a man's wrists are deeply burned, then smeared with a mustard paste as a therapy against an illness. Where there's no rational explanation as to why that would work other than that the patient would believe that it would work. Dr. Ari Keith has traveled the world in search of an understanding of therapeutic practices. By simply believing in the therapy, this man's mind helps him to heal. Can we ascribe healing powers such as these to other forms of therapy? I think what's exciting about what we've been learning from studying the primitives is that at the same time that we're making great advances in molecular biology, we're also becoming aware of the tremendous power of the mind, the power of positive thinking, the power of faith, uh, all of which, uh, when integrated, will, will, will open up a new era in the, in the treatment of psychiatric as well as physical illness. From around the world, we learn of strange therapies that seem to be impossible, yet they do work. Some researchers in our own country have invented unusual tools in an attempt to heal the sick. This strange device cured many people at the turn of the century, yet it actually does nothing but emit a blue spark. When a treatment has no explainable medical basis for affecting health, but somehow does, it is called a placebo. Dr. A.K. Shapiro has spent the last 20 years investigating the so-called placebo effect. A placebo is probably connected and related to the will to, to, uh, to live, the will to get better. It's probably a built-in genetic mechanism that helped mankind survive. It's omnipresent, everybody's subject to it. It's very difficult to recognize. It's probably universal. Dr. Shapiro has assembled a collection of placebos that rivals that of the Smithsonian. Some of the items that have been used over the years stretch the imagination. The most magnificent placebo in all of history, without qualification, is the unicorn horn. And the reason for that is that it was the most expensive treatment in the whole history of medicine. During the Middle Ages, people paid $500,000 for this unicorn horn because it cured everything. It was the most excellent aphrodisiac. And of course, only the royalty could afford to, could afford to buy such a thing. The people also had a treatment which involved bathing the unicorn in water and they drank unicorn water for pennies. 
Here is a powdered unicorn horn, which uh, I bought in Japan in a herbalist shop. Here's an aphrodisiac uh, recommended by uh, Maimonides, which consists of a hollowed out carrot into which you urinate. And it's a cure for impotence, which he wrote about in his volume or work on the treatment of sexual disorders. Here's uh, Hirudo medicinalis, that's a leech, which were extensively used in treatment to again withdraw the bad from the inside. These were all placebos used in the past. We asked Dr. Shapiro whether using laughter could be a placebo therapy. It is possible that laughter, like anything else, can be a placebo for the person who would respond to laughter therapeutically. However, for other people, it may not be a placebo at all. In fact, for some people, they may get uptight about that and be upset about it and feel worse or have a negative placebo effect. Without a placebo to help it along, can our mind cure illness? At the Lafayette Clinic in Detroit, a woman learns to control body functions that are normally beyond her control by a therapy called biofeedback. Sensitive monitoring equipment provides a signal or feedback from her body's responses, enabling her to reverse the symptoms of a painful condition known as Raynaud's disease. They would get the, they start to get white at fingertips and then go all the way up to the knuckles. Then they would get like a, a brilliant red. Then they would turn a purplish color, which is really scary. And that, that's when the numbness would set in and they would, well, they looked ugly. Project director, Dr. Robert Friedman, explains how biofeedback works. Biofeedback involves electronically monitoring and feeding back to the patient or subject information about a particular physiological function so that the patient hopefully can eventually learn to bring that function under his own control, eventually without the use of the machinery. Our work with biofeedback in Raynaud's disease tells us that at least in some cases, it's possible for people to control their physiological processes and thereby abort or turn around certain disease processes. Whether or not this is merely due to a placebo effect or whether it's due to some true intrinsic effects of biofeedback really remains to be determined by future research. Whether a placebo or not, this woman is using a form of therapy that allows her to use her mind to become well. But if burning wrists and electronics can be therapies, what else might work? This man is author and philosopher Norman Cousins. For him, laughter has a special value, for it may have played a key role in saving his life. I'll see you next week. After contracting a form of collagen disease he was told was fatal, he found himself weakened, but unwilling to die. Unable to accept either the diagnosis or hospital environment, he checked into a hotel and began a radical therapy large amounts of certain vitamins and regular doses of laughter. At the time we carried out specific medical tests to find out whether there was any basis for the <coughs> belief that laughter was therapeutic. And we discovered that there was and that uh, the experience I had which was that uh, laughter free, tended to free my body to some extent of pain and uh, would give me two hours of uh, pain-free and also pill-free sleep. This uh, was corroborated by the, by the test. If laughter and positive emotions can physiologically affect us, the changes should be measurable. Is it possible to scientifically record the healing power of laughter? Primates seem to share an ability to respond to tickling in a way that resembles laughter. What is not clear is the importance of laughter to either these orangutans or man. Is there a primitive and instinctual basis for laughing? If so, why? 
At Stanford University, psychiatrist Dr. William Fry takes part in a unique study. He is wired to monitor his body's vital physiology while experiencing sustained laughter. The primary study that we're doing this procedure here, the putting the uh, cannula into my artery, is to study, make a uh, direct uh, continuous study of the effect of laughter on blood pressure. There are also uh, these electrodes on my chest, which will give us uh, readings on the uh, heart rate and the uh, characteristics of the heart action. In other words, the, what's called the electrocardiogram. Will research reveal that laughter is the best medicine? There's no question about, in my mind, that laughter is good for you. I think that it's good for people in a number of different ways that having to do with this matter of the stimulation of various bodily processes. We can see in the blood pressure activity here that there's a stimulation of blood pressure responses. There's also an increase in the uh, heart rate that takes place. It's been demonstrated in other studies. We also know that there's quite a bit of muscular activity that accompanies laughter. You can just look at me and you can see how muscle groups all over my body are active. The ones you can't see in outward activity would be the diaphragm and my abdominal muscles, but I can assure you that they were very active too. So I get a very good exercise while I'm laughing. <laughs> I'm going to expect that this will tell us some very important things about the response of blood pressure to laughter in general, not just with myself. It's an area of science that hasn't been explored before. The, the whole uh, area of the physical effects of humor and laughter on the body is one that's relatively ignored. <laughs> is laughter contagious? Well, let's find out. <laughs> Performer Carl Reiner. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Television star Steve Allen. This good. All right. The annual spring training warm-up. The big league teams are all at the spring training headquarters around the country. Let's see what's happening. And what a joke does, at least many jokes do, they derail the logical train of thought. You think you're going to a certain point and then you're surprised. And I think this leads to perhaps some physical, literal spark in the, uh, the electricity of the brain. And for reasons not yet clear, uh, this produces the physical response of uh, pleasant surprise and, and, and laughter. We go, ha, 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 and the muscles go, boom, 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 that sort of thing. When you're unhappy, the juices flow that make you feel bad, and you feel things are happening. You feel a disintegration inside the body. When you're feeling badly and crying, there's tensions, and you know that your, your organs are reacting to it. You, they, they must be. And when you're laughing, you think of nothing. You feel happy. You feel good. You feel good. There's been a, a notion that I laughed my way out of a serious illness. Not, not quite true. Uh, laughter is a, is a good headline. But the important thing is that I try to employ all the positive emotions. <clears throat> Love, hope, faith, will to live, laughter. Laughter was important to be sure because laughter helps to oxygenate the blood, it enhances respiration. And uh, some medical researchers believe that it combats, combats toxicity. So laughter is important, but it would be a mistake to think that that is the only uh, positive emotion that was put to work. You laughs last. Well, happy people live longer. There's no doubt about it. 
At Children's Orthopedic Hospital in Los Angeles, stuntman Red Horton steps into a classic comic role. But doing a, a, a gig like that, it's of children especially, because it's so hard to hold attention. Um, it's really rewarding to feel that. He believes that a clown is a healer and that laughter is his medicine. Hello, how are you today? I'm here. Anyway. Hello? Hello? It's for you. It's Washington. Hello? It's the president. Hello? No, sell Egypt. When I can get a child to laugh, to forget about the pain that he's in right at that moment, it makes me really feel great inside and uh, makes me feel tremendous, makes me want to stay there as long as I can just to keep them laughing. You ready? Here we go. I'm going to balance this on my head, okay? You ready? I see myself in a role that has been carried on for centuries between uh, clowns, uh, Lute Jacobs, all the way back to the court jesters. I see myself trying to make people in general uh, a whole new outlook in life, something with a little humor, something to laugh at, something to feel good about, to feel good about living. Because, like, when you're hurt or your leg is uncomfortable, when you laugh, it makes it so you forget what what the pain is. And you don't, there's no laugh, there's no hurting. Just, you just laugh. It, it makes the pain go away because you just forget all about the pain. But not all pain is physical. And that's when laughter heals best. It's uh, a real privilege right now to bring to the stage at the Comedy Store one of our regular performers. She is a very special lady. Welcome right now, Jerry Jewell. Good night to a very reception. Yeah, how are we all tonight? Yeah, I can't lie to you people. You know, um, I got cerebral palsy. I knew that I had cerebral palsy when I was just a little kid. And I always used to admire the clowns and the circuses and stuff like that. And I always used to think that if they put me in a clown costume, nobody would ever know I had CP. You know, they always walk funny. <laughs> but I understand, you know, I'm not insensitive. And I understand that we're brought up in a society where we're taught not to stare or laugh at handicapped people. Well, tonight I'm going to break all those rules. <laughs> and I'm going to laugh at Trevor and Carter. <laughs> <laughs> Laughter is a strength. When you're a handicapped child, you get a lot of abuse from kids when you're little. And I had to sustain a lot of that. And I learned to laugh at myself because either that or I was going to be humiliated, you see. You know, I do impressions. Um, are you ready for an impression? Uh, I can do anybody with cerebral palsy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. Okay. This is my impression of a Q-tip. <laughs> What goes on between me and my audience is that there's a lot of love going back and forth. It's like I'm giving them love and they're giving me love and it's going back and forth. It's, it's vibes, a very strong vibe. I think the most beautiful part of being a comic is being successful on, with a set and walking off the stage and seeing everybody smile. It's so neat. And I, I love it. It's just 
makes me feel so great. Jerry Jewell knows what laughter can do. She has found a balm for the spirit and a world of love and acceptance because of a mystery <laughs> called laughter. We're very hopeful that these pioneer studies will make an uh, important contribution to the future, perhaps stimulating further studies in the future, perhaps providing some information that will contribute to an understanding of uh, human ag activities, human physiology, and perhaps even uh, human disease in the future. Is it possible that clowns and comedians through the ages have touched something we instinctively recognize is vital to our well-being? Can it be that Norman Cousins' story holds the key to medical insights yet to be explored? Insights that are linked to our mysterious ability to heal, an ability that crosses both cultures and time. It's obvious that laughter is important to us for our mental well-being. That's indisputable. Is it also possible that it actually helps to keep us well physically? We do know it feels good, but we don't know why. Will we, someday? Perhaps future research will more clearly define the positive physical effects of laughter. Until then, we can certainly continue enjoying its obvious psychological benefits. Lost civilizations, extraterrestrials, myths and monsters, missing persons, magic and witchcraft, unexplained phenomena. In search of cameras are traveling the world, seeking out these great mysteries. This program was the result of the work of scientists, researchers, and a group of highly skilled technicians.